Jeffrey, is the FDA doing much about this? Well, unfortunately, they are on the side of Monsanto. Uh, in fact, their former attorney and vice president is the food safety czar at the FDA. That's right. Uh, Michael Taylor. Now, he was uh, originally at the FDA. Then he became Monsanto's outside attorney. Then he became in charge of policy at the FDA when the GMO policy was created. The policy totally lied about what was going on at the FDA. We know that because documents were made public from a lawsuit years later. Uh, in Genetic Roulette, we interview the pioneer of that lawsuit, Steve Drucker, who says as he combed through the 44,000 secret internal memos at the FDA, he was shocked because he realized that the FDA had been lying years at, for years, that the, the basic fundamental premise of the FDA's policy was the statement that the agency wasn't aware of any information showing that GMOs were significantly different. And on that basis, no testing was necessary. No labeling was necessary. Companies like Monsanto, who told us that PCBs, Agent Orange, and DDT were safe, can completely determine on their own whether their GMOs were safe and tell, put it on the market without telling the FDA or consumers. But in reality, memo after memo showed that the reality within the agency was exactly the opposite, that they had warned repeatedly that GMOs were unique. They complained about the policy draft, saying, please don't claim that we have no difference between GMOs. It's like trying to force a square peg into a round hole. According to the technical experts in the agency, it's different, and it leads to different risks like allergens, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems, and all of that was ignored. So it's not just the FDA, but that's a good place to start when you look at the corruption of the government, but we can see it in other aspects of this government and other governments. Organic foods are not allowed to intentionally use GMOs, but the pollen doesn't read the signs. So sometimes there is transfer or what we call contamination, where maybe the seeds that the, that the farmer has bought are already contaminated. Maybe he gets wind blowing from a farmer's uh, neighbor. Sometimes organic will have a small amount of GMOs, a tiny amount. Um, in our shopping guide, we require that it be third-party verified by a non-GMO verifier, so it has to be actually tested. But even then, even with the third-party verification, if it has corn, if it has soy, it might have a tiny amount because we don't have a technology to fully prevent contamination. We don't have a technology to clean up the, the, the contamination of the gene pool. The genes already released today can outlast the, uh, the decay of nuclear waste, so it can go on for hundreds of thousands of years as long as the species exists. However, we still, we still promote organic as one of the uh, better oases of, for those of us seeking non-GMO because it's essentially the best we can do if we're going to have anything with soy or corn. And it's even better if it's been third-party verified by what's called the non-GMO project, which is, as I say, requires testing. Where can people see your new movie, Genetic Roulette? Um, GeneticRouletteMovie.com has the trailer. Um, we, have, we are going to place it up uh, online for uh, pay-per-view viewing, and we might even have a free showing week uh, or free showing period uh, coming up, but people have to sign up for the newsletter to hear about it. I was going to say, what's your venue? Internet? Uh, you going to well, right now, DVDs? Right now it's on DVD, so people can order the DVDs and they can get a discount for ordering a bunch because we really want it to get out there, especially while California is being educated about GMOs. Do you find that schools pick this up too? Yes, in fact, my both books, Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette, are being used in a variety of schools. I have them used in PhD programs and in high school, so the full, the full range. Um, and uh, we've already been asked by people, can we show it in schools? And they actually have started that already. I mean, it just came out at the end of August, like the last week in August, and it's already been shown in schools. We've had doctors seeing it. There was a doctor that saw it and realized this is the missing link in her practice, and she started now prescribing non gmo diets to every one of her patients. She picked up the phone and called doctors all over the country to let them know about her findings. Another person called hundreds of people in California about Prop 37 because it completely inspired her, saying this is something we have to do immediately. So it is, it is doing what we want, and that is it's changing people's diet, and it's getting them motivated to get on board the issue. When any state passes a labeling law, Monsanto is immediately going to try and sue to stop it in the courts. So now, there's no legal basis for stopping it, but that hasn't stopped some of Monsanto's supporters from the courts. For example, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, George Naylor, sued Monsanto and was refused class action status. And then the New York Times reported that the judge who had made that decision was a former uh, lawyer of record for Monsanto, and he never admitted it, and he never recused himself. Likewise, Clarence Thomas of the Supreme Court used to be a Monsanto attorney, and he did not recuse himself when voting in favor of Monsanto on another piece of, of um, uh, court work at the Supreme Court. So it's possible that they can manipulate things when there was a lawsuit against the FDA. There was a very twisted logic that the, the, the judge admitted that they had lied 
in the policy. They admitted that, they, that there was no consensus about safety, even though um, years of case law required consensus of safety to give something uh, generally recognized as safe status. That's a technical term. But basically, uh, after all that awareness, the judge just said, but we're not going to make any change. So uh, what they can do in the courts is it's hard to know. It's hard to predict. But in terms of, of cruelty to animals, yes, that is a new angle here for GMOs. We now have so much evidence, and a lot of it is in the film, about animals hurt as a result of eating GMOs and how quickly they get better when they switch to non-GMOs. This is something we're hoping to interest the groups that are trying to prevent cruelty to animals. What about animals in the wild? You know, it's a great question, and we've seen deer uh, avoiding GMOs. We've seen squirrels. There was a question earlier about rice bran oil, but we've seen squirrels, when given a choice, avoid GMOs. Geese, magpies, um, raccoons, elk, deer, mice, rats, chickens. So in the wild, we've seen animals avoid GMOs when given a choice, as well as in livestock situations, and it's very consistent uh, along a lot of different uh, species. Uh, sometimes they have to put the non-GMO corn at the bottom of a trough and put the GM corn at the top, forcing the animal to eat through, or if they just serve the GMO, the animal will, of course, eat it. Um, but in terms of wild animals, I, did, I do know that um, in Hawaii, Monsanto has a lot of test plots, and someone told me that some of the deer had horrible skin rashes and, and looked like disease states, uh, but that could be just complete coincidence, but it might also be the nasty chemicals or the GMOs that are, they're being exposed to. So there's not enough information and there's not enough monitoring of truly wild animal effects. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about l Sure. Uh, that it's been cleared since 19... It's been on back in the market since uh, right. 2007. Yeah, not that manufacturer, but, but, but the supplement sure has. Yeah, but, but it's been... It's uh, pharmaceutically pure and there's no adulterants and no, you know, uh, it's, it's free of any yeast, corn, et cetera, et cetera. Well, oh, that's good. And uh, it is safe to use, but it was off the it was off the market for all that like eighteen uh, from nineteen eighty nine till twenty oh seven. Wow, that long! And yeah. when they took it off the market, the FDA did not take it off the market out of infant formula. They didn't take it off the market out of IVs. They didn't take it off the market for pets. What happened was the FDA has an orientation to try and eliminate competitors to pharmaceutical drugs. And now tryptophan, as you said earlier, George, was used for sleep aid. It was used for stress and Prozac was coming out, and so they were trying to actually, and, and memos reveal this, they're trying to eliminate the natural competitors. And so they had tried to take L-tryptophan off the market before and were unsuccessful, and as soon as this epidemic was discovered, they drummed up this concept that it was L-tryptophan generically that caused the problem, even though it was only one brand that caused the problem. And so I was talking to experts about this years ago, and they said if it were generically L-tryptophan that caused the problem, you'd see, you'd see all of the brands causing the problem. Right. It but was, it's just one that was causing the problem. That was genetically good point. What can people generally do, and what do you recommend they do? Well, first of all, avoid GMOs, especially for children. And, you know, it's very difficult in some cases because the U.S. government WIC program gives infant formula to about 2 million moms, and all the infant formula that they give away is genetically engineered, unfortunately. It's very sad. But um, definitely avoid GMOs, and then get others involved, because by share, that's actually why we created the film Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, because you know, I've written a couple of books and I've done some smaller documentaries, but we, we wanted to put it together in one feature-length documentary where we, people would watch it once and they'd get to what we call the cupboard stage, where they'd actually go and remove the GMOs from their cupboards and they would want their loved ones and their friends to see the movie. And so this is why our, our institute, our nonprofit Institute for Responsible Technology, produced the video, because we think if this thing goes viral, if this thing really takes off, it'll influence enough people to cause the tipping point. Are there other organizations that are growing, that are popping up to fight this? Oh, yeah, more than ever before. Um, in, 19, in 2009, uh, Supermarket News predicted that there would be an unprecedented upsurge of consumer awareness and concern starting in 2010, and that's exactly what we saw. And I would be the only one crisscrossing the United States since 2003 talking about GMOs, and I noticed a very big difference in 2010. People would come up to me after lectures and start start describing the health dangers with such articulate uh, descriptions, and they would talk about how they've gotten their fellow parents of autistic kids involved, that they've gotten their customers at their health food store, they've gotten their clients. So there were pockets of activism springing up independently around these very knowledgeable, very enthusiastic activists. And I realized this is completely new, and this is a sign of a coming tipping point, because we had in our midst a real force for change. So we scrambled to help support that. We've created what's called the Tipping Point Network that people can sign up for at responsibletechnology.org, where they can hook up with other people in their areas. And, yes, we have thousands of people now doing this. But independent of our work, it's still popping up because, like in Connecticut, 
uh, no one asked um, the particular legislator to introduce a labeling bill. He just did it on his own, and then we found him, and then I went and testified before the, the uh, committee, and we had a press conference and stuff. So we're actually scrambling to keep up now because it seems like the patterns are now lively in collective consciousness as people become aware, oh, GMOs are bad. And it's been supported also by a rash of, of media coverage starting in mid-2010 when the FDA wanted to approve uh, salmon, and then there was a court case for alfalfa and sugar beets, and then alfalfa and sugar beets were approved in 2011. And it's become more of a household word than ever before. Okay, so when you're going to be planting seeds in a garden, there are four crops for food that you want to be concerned about. Corn. Okay. Zucchini, okay. yellow crookneck squash, and if right. you're in Hawaii, then papaya. Those are the only four seeds that they can modify. That they that they're currently commercialized. They can modify things. They want to introduce a genetically modified apple that doesn't turn brown. Crazy idea. They want to introduce everything. They want to introduce eggplant in India, but that was struck down. They want to introduce cauliflower and onions and potatoes. Actually, potatoes were introduced but kicked off the market. Tomatoes were introduced but kicked off the market. But right now. Those seeds, only four for food crops. Yeah. You know, one thing is this. When you learn about the dangers of genetically engineered foods, sometimes you just get frustrated and angry. And I tell people, you know, don't take it out on the waiter or the waitress. Don't take it out on the, on the People just don't know. You know, they serve canola oil. It's not, you know, they don't know that it's genetically engineered. They think it's a healthy oil. They serve soybean oil because everyone's using it. So, and it's frustrating because people realize they have to give up their, their, the food that they're ordering in restaurants. They have to give up some of their favorite brands. And it's something that you have to sort of develop a level of compassion. And uh, you can basically have to do what you can do. Not everyone has control of their diet. Here's what I, what I uh, pick up from healthcare practitioners. In some cases, um, the, they don't find that people are gluten sensitive, uh, but they're GMO sensitive. And the, the reduction of GMOs and the elimination of GMOs has a big impact. And, and they're not taking gluten out of the diet. In some cases, like in the cases of autistic kids, they'll go to a gluten-free and casein-free diet, and they'll still end up having lots of symptoms and reactions, and when they switch to non-GMO organic, the remaining symptoms go away. Even though there was a big step up during the gluten-free, casein-free uh, stage, it sort of finished off with a big increase. Now, many people think that there's an, the increase in gluten intolerance is not just better detection, but there actually is an increase in gluten intolerance, and that could be related to GMOs, because if GMOs, like the BT toxin, is drilling holes in the intestinal walls, changing the structure of the intestinal villa, causing a, a higher degree of overall immune system reaction, messing up the gut bacteria, causing kind of gut dysbiosis. These are things that could affect the way the body reacts to a host of, of uh, foods, including gluten. GMOs may increase gluten intolerance, and I'm going to be looking at some of the that evidence be. for yeah. that. That, that. That truly could be. Let's talk a little bit about pesticides for a moment, Jeffrey. What's out there on the market these days? Well, my focus is primarily on GMO-related pesticides, and that's primarily been Roundup. Now, Roundup is interesting in that it was patented as a broad-spectrum chelator. Now, you think of chelation when someone has heavy metal poisoning. You take a chelation, it, it binds with it, and it brings it out of the body. But in this case, Roundup binds with minerals, making them unavailable to the plant. The plant then becomes weak, and it becomes susceptible to disease. The Roundup also promotes pathogens in the soil, which then rise up and kill the plant. So it creates a perfect storm of weakened, sick plants and stronger pathogens. It also kills beneficial bacteria in the soil. And so Roundup is now found in air samples and water samples and rain samples and in the urine of city dwellers and the blood of pregnant women and the unborn children. So that is actually practically an omnipresent chemical, especially in the Midwest where I'm from. Now, there's another variety of herbicide that's associated with genetically engineered crops if it gets approved. And that's 2,4-D, which is linked to cancer and Parkinson's and birth defects and other problems. And it was half the component of Agent Orange, and its production often produces dioxin as a contaminant. Now, the overuse of Roundup has caused Roundup-resistant weeds, and so now, as we mentioned, they want to introduce Agent Orange crops. And it's actually right now in the comment stage, and so it could be approved at any time. And what about the crops now that are resisting, fighting back? Yeah, what's happening is it's like uh, nature herself is just getting angry at Monsanto, but it was actually predicted. When you overuse an antibiotic, you end up with antibiotic resistance. When you overuse a weed killer, the weeds develop resistance. There's now about 20 million acres uh, in the United States that have Roundup-resistant weeds, including what people call the superweed or the, the kingweed, which is a pigweed, which can grow 10 feet high and have a stem the size of a baseball bat and can create 
400,000 seeds. And so it can destroy harvesting equipment in the south for cotton. And so now what they're doing is they're taking hoes and machetes into the field to, to knock down this Roundup-resistant weeds. And this was predicted by those who were concerned about GMOs and ignored by Monsanto, and it's coming back to bite them. I think that the 42% rise in irritable bowel disease uh, since GMOs were introduced is related to GMOs. I think the basic inflammatory reaction, uh, if you go to the film uh, Genetic Roulette, very early in the film, we have a number of, of scientists and doctors saying that GMOs cause inflammation, and the first interaction with a GMO is the gut. And so we'll see a lot of exactly what you said, ulcerative colitis, etc. cetera, that uh, they were, it was all on the rise since GMOs were introduced. And I was talking to a farmer named Howard Ligger today, and he did a study where he, he took the pig stomachs that were fed either GM feed or non-GM feed from a slaughterhouse and photographed them and, and examined them and found that there was ulcers and inflammation in the stomach of the pigs that were fed the GMOs. And with the, with the Denmark... A uh, pig farmer who took his pigs off of genetically modified soy, previously over two years, 36 had died from ulcers and bloat. In the year since going to non-GM soy, none died from those. So we have, we have evidence in laboratory animals, in livestock, in humans, and what's happening is these inflammatory responses in the digestive tract are generally correlated with an increase since GMOs were introduced. So I, I totally agree, and you know, I personally would want to see GMOs banned, but in the current climate, the Obama administration has been worse uh, on GMOs than the Bush administration. They put, you know, the former Biotech Governor of the Year, Tom Vilsack, as the Secretary of Agriculture. They put Monsanto Man as head of the U.S. Agency for International Development, as the U.S. Trade Representative for Agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you read the WikiLeaks, the State Department is basically deployed as a Monsanto's enforcement wing overseas. So I don't hold any, any uh, false notions that we're going to be bailed out like the banks uh, out of the GMO problems by the Obama administration. So I think Labeling is a key, and in the meantime, we have the non gmo shopping guide. In the good old days, of course, farmers could hold back some of their seed, and, uh, you know, they'd have enough for the following year, they'd plant it, have enough for the following year, and so on and so on. With the GMO seeds and the crops, why can't they even, even, let's not even argue the merits of the GMO, but why can't they just use the seeds and hold them back for the following planting season? Well, it turns out that Monsanto and others require a contract signed that the, that the farmer will not save seeds. Ah. And they want to introduce what's called terminator technology, which would force the plants to produce sterile seeds, which would in turn force the farmers to have to go back to the limited genetics available in the seed catalog. That's but dangerous. They, yes, that's extremely dangerous, because right now there's 1.4 billion farmers that save seeds, which means there's millions of varieties of diverse, diverse seeds that have been optimized for different climate and geography. And when Terminator technology was created, it was specifically promoted as a technology to target these 1.4 billion farmers, mostly in developing countries, so that it would enrich the pockets of the biotechnology companies, but dramatically cut out the biodiversity at a time of global climate change, which is when you want to have the diversity to be able to change the seeds so that they'll, you know, that they'll work with changing climates. So they're willing and ready to risk the food security of the world based on improving their profit. But, you know, I, I was wondering if Monsanto uh, is involved. When you, when you mentioned sterilization and miscarriages, did you ever consider that it's part of the program of the depopulation of the world and some of the other side effects? Well, that's going to happen, too. And it would be interesting to see what's on the CEO of uh, Monsanto's menu. And I'll just take my <laughs> call off the phone yeah. here. Thank you so much. Sure thing. In my book, Seeds of Deception, I have a quote from the manager of the restaurant that's found inside Monsanto's U.K. headquarters. He was sent a letter asking if he uses GMOs, and he responded by saying, based on concerns expressed by our customers, we've decided to remove GMOs from our restaurant. Now, the people who are their customers are Monsanto's employees. Um, it's interesting that uh, another person told me that her friend was accompanying a very large group of you know, of of Monsanto employees from their headquarters to somewhere else, and they were staying in a, they were eating at a food service in another company or another place. And the person just joked, "Well, we're probably gonna get some GMOs here." And the person responded very seriously, said, "Oh no, no, we we have, we carry our own, we bring our own organic food," which was a kind of shock. And another former Monsanto scientist said that three of his colleagues did safety studies on the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone and found so much of the cancer-promoting hormone called IGF-1 in the milk from treated cows 
these three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. We also know that when the uh, healthy policy, so to speak, of the Obama kitchen were being established with a preference for organic, it was revealed that the Bush administration required absolutely 100% organic in the White House kitchen, and that was insisted upon by Laura Bush. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any documentation that shows uh, purposeful harm from the biotech industry from GMOs, except we are aware that um, the former Monsanto scientist did say that when the rats were hurt by Monsanto's corn, they redesigned the study to hide the effects of the corn rather than withdraw it. So we know that from Monsanto's past, they have known that their previous uh, products like PCBs and Agent Orange and DDT were highly toxic and continued to lie about it and even be convicted in courts and also been convicted in courts about lying about Roundup, for example. So we know that they're certainly capable of lying. They're experts at lying. They've been lying about GMOs all along. I'm not sure about a depopulation agenda. There are two types of genetically modified crops for cotton and most of the crops. One is that it allows uh, the spray of herbicide. The other is that it produces its own toxic insecticide. Um, in India, unlike in the United States, they harvest the cotton by hand. And when they harvest the Bt cotton, they're getting rashes and itching all over their bodies. Uh, in fact, this has been an, uh, a source of investigation uh, by, uh, by scientists and by reporters. They looked at hospital records. They interviewed pharmacy managers. I traveled throughout India asking people in the cotton-growing regions about itching. And so that is something that, was, that we're finding in very, very high concentrations in, in kids' faces, etc. They could just be leaning against uh, picked cotton and break out into rashes and itching. So we don't see that in the United States because they harvest by machine, and uh, we think that that's the reason why we don't see it here. Um, but you would have the Bt toxin that's produced by the um, cotton is one problem, and then you have the higher doses of Roundup. And, of course, when they're spraying a lot of Roundup, then it can be in the water supply, it can be in the air, it can be in the rain. In fact, the U.S. Geological Survey found it in 60 to 100 percent samples in rain and air. So that's a problem living near GMOs. And there's also birth defect possibilities. The areas where there's Roundup-ready crops in Argentina, there's as much as a 70-fold increase in birth defects. In larger regions, it was about 400% in birth defects, 300% in cancer. So these are from exposure to the herbicides in the air as they're being sprayed. And with, with Argentina, they spray by plane, and it's drifted right over the peasant villages. It's actually killed one. 11-year-old boy who was riding his bicycle and got sprayed. So there's very serious implications there. As far as which GMOs and what's not, the wheat is not genetically modified. And this week, there was a study that came, I mean, a, a, a very important announcement by some expert scientists that the genetically modified wheat being trialed in India may trigger a deadly liver disease when consumed by humans, mm. and that it, caused, it could experience a decline of glycogen production in their bodies, leading to liver failure. And when children have this, they generally die by age five. So I'm just now going through the technical arguments by these three experts, uh, and it's quite com compelling that the uh, regulators and Monsanto completely overlooked this very, very serious problem, which if this wheat was introduced, it could cause widespread sickness and death. But the wheat is not yet introduced, but the cotton is, the corn is, the soybean is, and the canola, which you may not have access and to. And I'm more concerned, Jeffrey, about some major calamity, which will be caused worldwide by playing around with Mother Nature. In, in fact, you know, we talked earlier about bacteria being released and found everywhere in the, everywhere in the world, you know, by an EPA test uh, where they found that you could make influence weather conditions. Uh, there's this new organism that's out there. We already have evidence of, of near catastrophes and what I think is a probable catastrophe because of what, of we have the increase of multiple chronic illnesses in the United States where people have at least three chronic illnesses. It went from 7% when GMOs were introduced in 1996 to 13% nine years later. We have food allergies doubling since GMOs were introduced. We have obesity up. We have, we have evidence that it might be related to diabetes because of dysfunctional regulation of insulin. So there's all sorts of very, I mean, we have, we, the U.S. ranks, I think, 175th in, uh, in infant mortality. It's like we have, we have terrible statistics, and we have terrible food, and the most radical change in the food supply is GMOs.